you're using the very smelly, pungent, loud shrimp paste in your special menu. Yes. Can any food work for fine dining? Fine dining. It takes place in expensive restaurants, serving premium food to those who can afford it. We want to make people feel more comfortable from the reservation to when you leave the restaurant. But behind the nice clothes and crystal stemware, what am I looking at here? Is real food with real humble beginnings. This is the small cow intestine. In this exclusive series, we're demystifying high-end cuisine. It's always been a dream of mine to eat a truffle, like an apple. Do it. He's like, it's not going to be how you think it's going to be. Exactly. <laughs> and following high-priced ingredients back to their source. Around 2,000 ducks that we have here. Wow. It's really ducking loud here. <laughs> Today, this trailer park kid from central Minnesota. And when you stand correctly, you feel strong. Is going to do his best to blend in. Stomach in, chin a little bit down. Let up and like this. And. Okay, never mind. Today, this experience, it's about a tasting menu. Have you ever had a tasting menu? Everything is just really small portion, like the smallest by side, right? I want to find out why restaurants with the biggest price tags often dish out the least amount of food. Let's start here. Breathe it in. Do you smell that? You mean this one. <laughs> this is Vietnam's most violent condiment. Strong, pungent aromatics. Some even prefer using the word stinky when it comes to describing this. Like a Red Bull in your nostrils or something else in your nostrils. Beautiful. Vietnamese fermented shrimp paste. I think it's good. I tasted it. You tasted it? Yes, sir. Yum. Ooh. It's so putrid, but there's something so it's addictive nice. about it. Hey! In this restaurant, they use it as a dipping sauce for a unique array of dipping vehicles. Boiled pork, fried tofu, fried young rice pork cakes, fried blood sausage, vermicelli noodles, and plenty of herbs. To me, this is kind of like a tasting menu, right? Many little options of foods. They've got fried tofu, cucumber. What's your technique when you eat this? I'm no. just gonna grab it and then deep it. All right, here's a fried pork cake. It's such an intense, pungent, violent flavor. But it's so good! By the time you cleanse your palate with the herbs, you're like, oh, I want round two. I want to go again with this thing. Okay, let's do this one. Blood sausage. Wow. Mm -hmm. This is really good. They have nuts in their sausage. Mm -hmm. A little bit of herb. This meal right here, less than $3. Mm. The tasting menu we're going to try later, around $81. Joanne and I have been through a lot this year, and she's proven herself oh to be a loyal friend of the show. <laughs> Happy Bug <Love> Day! <laughs> so I've invited Twin to be my eating partner in this fine dining series to offer some balance. So soon, we're going to a place called Monkey Gallery, where they do all this different high-end food here in Saigon, Vietnam. I'm a little worried. Why? Well, I'm new to having money. I don't know how to act properly. I wasn't raised right. I wasn't raised that much at all, to be honest. What about you? I'm a very typical Vietnamese. When I eat, usually I put my feet on. <laughs> it's embarrassing, but it's so comfortable. And then when you have my dining experience, usually like, oh, everybody is so proper. Like, what am I doing here? Right, but maybe everyone's thinking how you're thinking. Maybe uh -huh. everyone in there is insecure and unsure of themselves. Maybe, I hope so. That's what I just assumed to make myself feel better. Ah, oh, look at all these insecure people. I'm normal. Meet Viet Hong, trained in France, where he learned foundational culinary skills in a five-star hotel kitchen. Now he's making his own path, returning to Vietnam and creating Saigon's trendiest tasting menu experience. You'll never guess the places that I've been. Here, he's got more freedom and he can take more risks, offering a unique menu based largely on local ingredients. Mình hay rất là mua nọng heo ở đây vì chất lượng của nọng heo rất là ngon. Some of which you'd never expect to find on a fine dining menu. Đây là phần ngon nhất của cái mái heo. Like pork jowl. Cái lượng nạc và mỡ nó phải đang xen với nhau. And pungent fermented shrimp paste. This is going to be interesting. I feel like we're not in your restaurant. Yeah, we are in Chalang Market. Right now we're standing next to some of the smelliest local ingredients in Vietnam. A lot of aromas, yeah. right? Later today, we're actually going to see you use this ingredient in your special menu. Yeah. It is called Mam Dum Cha. Good job! Good job! Oh. Approved! Thank you. 
you can toss your toothpick in there, kind of get it nice and coated. Let's try it out. Wow, it's really good. Yeah, I kind of like that. It has a depth of savory saltiness. They have a lot of umami. Right. Pure umami. It's super different from what we had earlier today, though. Yeah, right? because that one is from the north, so the technique is different. With fine dining, I assume like all the ingredients need to be really elegant and expensive, foie gras, caviar. Like, can any food work for fine dining? Uh, tell, uh, tell we can go on. The stage is being set for you by the waiters. Fine dining is said to have begun in France hundreds of years ago. Traditionally, this premium dining experience was quite formal. Dress codes were enforced and white linens were the standard. We used to think about fine dining as like really expensive ingredients that like you said, but he said right now the current trend is shifting. The cooks, they try to play with different kind of ingredients that just show like themselves a little more. These days, that rule book has been tossed out the window and the words fine dining mean something different altogether. Me fine dining now, high level food, good service, and that can come from any level of restaurant. Today's chef learns without borders, adopting the use of ingredients and cooking techniques from around the globe. When you are going to any country in the world, you have to use the best produce you can find, and then you can raise them up to a fine dining. Creativity trumps tradition, as chefs look for new ways to challenge the palates of their diners. You can cross cultural, uh, cross cuisine in a plate, if it's good then we can serve it. This is no longer the food of the ruling class. This is a classroom with no rules, attended by anyone who loves food and who can still afford it too. Part of fine dining is tasting menus. So what is a tasting menu? Usually a tasting menu includes nine to 10 courses. The purpose of it is that the customer, they really want to experience something new and uh, to try the best of the restaurant. The menu here is always in fluctuation, depending on the availability of ingredients and the chef's creative inspiration. Right now, he's assembling two dishes inspired by Vietnamese street food. While we're in the kitchen, we're gonna try one of your menu items. Is your arm burning off? Are you okay? Is yeah, it cooking? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Medium rare? <laughs> okay. If it gets to medium, let me know. We'll stop. First up, beef intestine. Small intestine seasoned with a fermented miso paste mixture gets grilled. Then it's stuck with rosemary, topped up with miso honde foam and pepper. Now, before we jump into it, should we eat first with our eyes and then our nose and then our mouth? Do you listen to it too? Or? And then listen. <laughs> My God, that's an intestine? Yeah. It's so smoky and creamy. That has to be the most delicious intestine I've ever had in my life. Next, he'll somehow take one of the world's most offensive smelling ingredients and level it up, marrying pork jowl with fermented shrimp paste. He prepares the meat, seasons it with sesame oil, pepper, and fish sauce, and grills it over charcoal. So he said he got inspiration from street food in Vietnam because he said it's very much rare when you go to a tasting menu and a fine dining experience that you're gonna taste something that's very strong and a lot of umami like this. Finally, he plates it. A leaf piled with herbs, the pork jowl, and a fermented shrimp. On the side, chili paste and fermented shrimp paste. How do I eat this? It's like tacos. You use your hand to uh, roll the salad, and then you dip in the sauce. Fantastic. Should we try it out? Yay, let's go. Cheers. Oh my god. Wow. It's like uh, umami bomb. You can mm. feel a lot of flavor mm -hmm. in this roll. It is like a, a symphony of music to my taste buds. Oh, the shrimp paste with the pork is so good. It's really delicious. There's fresh herbs, kind of giving a little bit of aromatics. Mm. Yeah, we do have a lot of like wrap and roll stuff. And then there's like an upgraded version of it. Yeah, it's so powerful. The heavy pork kind of greasy and cuts well with this super umami or savory shrimp paste. Yeah. That is an experience. The menu tonight has how many courses? The biggest menu is around 15 courses. That's wild, huh? That's yeah, yeah. crazy. Here, tasting menus can range from six courses to 15. We're settling for nine. So for that whole experience, that's still only around $78. I know $78 is not a small amount for going out, but for some of the top quality food you're gonna find anywhere, made with creativity, artistry, it seems like a pretty good deal. I think the same. Would you pay that much? Uh... While the chef is preparing for tonight, I have someone I need to see. I don't know the best way to sit for this. 
Chang, a yes. pleasure to meet you. Ms. Chang, founder and principal of John Robert Powers Vietnam. This is a training facility where they're teaching proper Western etiquette, something I'm surely lacking. Now, I'm Western. I don't know how much Western etiquette I know. So far, how am I doing? I think you look great, very confident and friendly. Hey, thank you. Ah, she must have taken a compliment class as well. Do you teach a compliment class? Uh, the reason I'm here is I'm doing this whole series on fine dining and I kind of feel like it's a place I don't really belong. Being confident with your etiquette is the key to being self-confident. Is it more important to look good or to present myself good? Uh, both for the fine dining, everything is important. From your appearance... I think you should chew for you some more colors. When you're honest, sometimes it, 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 I feel it in the heart. <laughs> I'm sorry. To your posture... Just, you know, Relax. Mm. No. Even the way you walk. The way you walk rather old if compared with your age. When you know the proper way to act, you can show proper respect for yourself and others. When you enter to the restaurant with your friends, if she is a lady, you have to pull the chair for her first. And after she sit down, you can come to your place to sit. Hey, can you actually sit up a little bit? Oh, okay, sit down. Change. And oh, I there sit. we go. Oh! <laughs> well, I learned that I need to push your chair in, even though I'm paying your salary right now. <laughs> you want to project confidence, appear comfortable, and make those around you feel comfortable as well. So when we eat, you know, our body with the table about 10 cm. Are you serious? Oh my lord. <laughs> Don't make the noise when you eat. We do have this kind of class in our university before. Mm. I skipped it. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask, what's your favorite rule that when your students are watching, like what rule do you just break all the time? I maybe I will eat a uh, bigger than normal. Mm. <laughs> there are a lot of rules. Cheers. For just about every part of the meal. When you ring also, don't make noise. Don't make noise. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but no rule is more important than your attitude. With all the skills I learned today, I'm going to bring that to this meal. It's going to be better than ever. Awesome. Can't wait. Are you hungry? Yes, very much. Okay, now we're ready. Course one, Ooh. the palate opener. An oyster is brought back to its natural habitat, topped in a velvety oyster cream, apple, zest of lime, and covered with apple foam. Yeah, really? oh. It's a beautiful presentation. I'm going to give it a smell. Okay, look at how mm. you hold your bowl now. Oh, Fresh. look at that. Yeah, I'm sorry, are you mocking me? Do you need to go to etiquette <laughs> no. school? Wow, that sour, sweet apple, but it kind of takes away all that seafoody, briny flavor that can be in there sometimes. Great way to start. Course two, Action. the harmony of Asia. Hong Kong shumai, combined with the Vietnamese snail, paired with a pesto made of local herbs and silky mushroom sauce. So much detail put into this. It's insane. Wow, this is very new to me. The snail goes surprisingly well with the pork. It's super creative. Mm. Wow. Course three, inspired from Japan. A scallop soaked in ponza dressing and miso oil, adorned with jewels of flavor, including sea grapes. So the problem with doing a video about this kind of food is when someone looks at this, there's no way they can relate to it. Even for me, it's confusing. I'm right here. Wow. Do you expect a scallop to have that texture? No. Because usually it's kind of like chewy, right? Yeah. This one is kind of like melting. Exactly. Course four, Japanese mushrooms. For the next course, we have the smoky straciatella. How do you pronounce the cheese? Straciatella. That is the thing inside the burrata. Oh. Uh, we pair with the grilled shiitake and king oyster mushroom. And on top, we have the mizuna salad with a little bit sancho pepper from Japan. You smell that? Truffle smell. That's truffle. Really smoky. Mm, but you don't feel like overwhelming. Like you feel full, but it's not heavy. I don't know how to explain that, but it's really cool like that. It's super cool like that. <laughs> Stop! No. Oops. You know, there's someone I could have you talk to. She teaches etiquette. Huh? Course number. Six? Five. This is a palate cleanser. Mm. Oh. Meant to reset the taste buds, preparing them for what's mm. next. Palate is cleansed. Veal sweetbread is sauteed with butter, garlic, and thyme. The biggest question on this video is, why is it when people go to certain fine dining restaurants, they feel like they pay a lot of money, and then they just get a little speck of food? Oh, I like Plated it. with curry, torched melted butter, 
green beans and chiffonade lime leaves. Delicious. So he said like when you taste food like that, it makes you crave it even more. Oh. That's my seed. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is like fatty and springy. Like it's hard to bite through. And then the sauce around it, ooh, it's a bit spicy. Exactly. By now we've had smoky, savory, sweet, sour, spicy. <laughs> There's like three courses left, right? Mm. Now you just have to bring out all the guns. Spending your dinner indulging in a tasting menu is for the adventurous. You never know what's coming, and sometimes you don't even know what's right in front of you. Oh, more foam. It could be pleasant, like this. We were just told this is our first main course. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm ready for a nap right now. Torched toothfish paired with cassava puree, spinach, and topped with butter foam. Mm. Oh, the fish is great. I'm kind of running out of descriptive words. Or more daring, like this dry-aged duck breast. Sautéed, bathed in tamarind sauce, and served with Japanese radish and soybean paste. Mm, how does it work? The skin is very crispy, but this one is like totally juicy. It's decadent, so rich, very nice. I'm ready for dessert. Ideally, you'll experience a tornado of flavors and textures. This is something the Keebler elves would make if they were on acid. Challenging your whole notion of what's delicious. Mm, we've done it, nine courses. That's incredible. Overall, 10 by 10, I loved it. Mm. There was a good mix of some recognizable food and some where it's like, oh, I know what that is, but mm. they put a little twist on it. And then some foods where it's like, what have you done to that scallop? They mutilated a scallop and turned it into something I've never seen yeah. before. Since it's like a high-end restaurant, right? Like I would expect something more, but it's not intimidating at all. It's very, very cozy and yeah. I mean, I can chill with friends here. Mm. The mainstream eating scene in the USA places value on food volume. Roll! Here, the focus is on premium ingredients, artistry, technique, and creativity. But why do people like them? And even more, why are they so darn expensive? There's a lot of items that make sense as far as being on a fine dining menu. But with oysters, I don't completely understand. Today, we're going deep into the world of oysters visiting a remote floating ocean farm. This is the typical oyster everybody knows. When you go to a restaurant, I want to see how locals cook up this tasty treat. It looks like it's fried. Oh. Compared to one of the most luxurious fine dining restaurants in town. Oh. Oh. What a fancy fish. <laughs> it all starts right here. Twin. Uh -huh. The fine dining series officially starts right now. It doesn't feel like it here, yeah? I know. Do you know where we are? I have no idea. You should know where we are. We didn't blindfold you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Wang Ninh is a coastal province in northeastern Vietnam. Fishermen here supply a huge amount of seafood to nearby provinces and cities, especially oysters. All these bamboo lattices being supported just by big bricks of styrofoam. I think that's what makes it float. I didn't even pay attention. I'm trying to figure out how I can walk on those. And then there's uh, tons of strings that are holding these oysters. These suckers have been hanging by a thread in the ocean for nearly a year. That means it's time to harvest. There's about 30 people out here all working together, kind of forming a human chain, picking the oysters and bringing it into the boat. How often does this happen? Like Ah, uh, yeah, around a year. Oh, year round? Yeah. Today, we're getting a closer look at Mr. Lin's oyster farm. Oh, some of these are mussels too, though. Be careful, though, it's super sharp. Years ago, he left the area's prominent charcoal industry in the mountains and headed for the coast buying boats and building the bamboo structures that would become home to thousands of oysters. What made you want to switch gears and live the oyster life? Yeah, so he said mainly because of the profit. Oh, it's not for the love of oysters? <laughs> With only 10 of these bamboo lattice structures spread across the sea, Lin is able to produce 200 tons of oysters per year. The bamboo is very strong. It's nearly unbreakable, some say, oh God. It is breakable. Oh my god. Each structure earns him roughly $45,000. Multiply that by 10 farms, and you've got one man very happy with his investment. How do you plant an oyster? How do you grow an oyster? At first, um, the oyster are small like his nail. <laughs> okay. Uh, what? Are you sure they're small? <laughs> They attach everything into this rope, and I asked him like, okay, do you do anything in that one year? And he said, no, I just left it there. <laughs> they eat like tiny little creatures in the ocean. Now, I've heard oysters are kind of like the filters for the ocean, keeping it clean. So in that case, is it still good to eat? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see a smirk right there. <laughs> 
Mr. Lin grows two types of oysters. This is known as a sea acorn, a domestically grown, bite-sized creature. The other one, like you need to buy the shell. This one, it just attached by itself. So you just put string in the water and yeah. these shells grow on it? Oh yeah, he said exactly like that. All right, yeah. I'm interested. They take six oh. months to raise and they're less profitable, but they're low risk Yo. and in high demand among locals. Hmm, I like it. Briny, oceany so cool. taste. It sounds so overwhelming. Then there's this guy. Whoa. The Pacific Oyster. This is the typical oyster everybody knows. When you go to a restaurant... <laughs> is everything okay? A much bigger species, often exported overseas. There it is, like a big goober. Why do I have such a big one? Oh, that's so salty. I want to eat it in my... <laughs> oh! It tastes like just drinking a cup of straight up ocean water. It is very salty. I like that it's meaty, mm. but it's also kind of gooey. It's pretty iffy. Bigger is not always better. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't laugh. I don't understand that. While most of these oysters are being exported, some are sold locally in Vietnam. Here, these ladies are doing some oyster shucking. Like, a lot of shucking, making their way through this massive pile. Ma'am, did you make this in prison? How'd you get this knife? What is going on there? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I did to the last guy who asked too many questions. <laughs> Once you have your shiv in hand, that's... That's ram. No, what? That's only in Japan. These shells will be tied back together on the same ocean fairing string and thrown back in the water where a new generation of these guys will grow. How much do you think this would sell for at the market? 5,000 dong. 5,000. Yeah. Does it blow your mind that in Saigon there are some fine dining restaurants that sell these guys for like $2 a piece? <laughs> so why? She said, very shocked, yeah. She's very happy that she can sell this for 5,000 here. Oh, Since really? this is the source of it, she understands in Saigon because people have to pay for logistic money. No. Oh. Oh, I thought we were doing a flashback sequence. <laughs> <laughs> Before we jump into some of the world's fanciest oysters, we're getting a humble, heart-filled local lunch. Ma'am, good afternoon. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Uh she started cooking at nine and spent 20 years in the kitchen so far. You have all types of different seafood, especially oysters. How popular are the oysters on the menu? Oyster and shrimp are the most popular items on the menu. Today, Miss Aunt is cooking us four very different oyster dishes, sourced straight from the farms we just visited. She just invited us to try this dish. It looks like it's fried. Oh. <laughs> nice catch! <laughs> Dish one, deep fried sea acorn. This is sea acorn, but like it's the bigger one. Oh, there's a big and a small variety? Yeah. They've been basking in the ocean for six months. Now they're soaking up some dill and flour. Oh, hi, ba. Yo. Yo. Yeah. Hmm? I don't know if I've had fried oysters. That's pretty good. It has the seafood essence without all the ocean water taste. What do you think? It's really rich. Yeah, it's rich and high in nutrition. I fucking love nutrition. Rock. This is like chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets of the sea. Mm. Just to be sure about the taste, I better have one more. Mm. What is that? Is that coriander? Coriander, yeah. Mmm. Mm. <laughs> you have the farm right next door. It's super fresh. It's super affordable for you guys. Is this still looked at as some special food or are you just kind of used to it? She said like the taste still tastes very good to them. But I think it's because it's so commonly eaten that, you know, it's not that big of a deal like, like what it is to us. For me, it's a very big deal. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Before we leave your kitchen, I want you to get back to work. But can we try one more dish with these small acorn oysters? Mm. Editor, this is where you put in the voiceover. It's made with this, yeah. this, and this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then she comes back, and then we're back in the seat. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. What is this one? This is a sea acorn with a tomato sauce topped up with fresh dill. This is her childhood dish. Well, let's take a bite of your childhood. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. That's ultra yummy. You can taste the dill, right? Yeah. Very, very, um, wow. Ultra savory, nice acid from the tomato. The oyster is just kind of soft and tender and breaking apart, but none of that like aggressive oceanic taste. It's kindly welcomed into my stomach. Oh, nice. Our last two dishes in Wang Nin feature these giant oysters. Raw oysters set upon perilla leaves with a sprig of fresh julienne ginger. And grilled oysters topped with an in-house special sauce containing chili sauce, scallions, fried shallots, and peanuts. Five star, five dining view. It's got a great view. <laughs>
I got a little bit of lime juice on here, some of this really thick soy sauce. Mm. Let's try it out. Just shovel the whole thing back, I think. Oh, wow. The leaf is what makes it a salad. That, I don't know. It's um, just a big glob of ocean water. What about for you over there, on your side of the table? <laughs> a lot of salt water coming from the oyster. A tidal wave of ocean water going down my throat. Oh. Uninvited. No, you invited it. No, I didn't want it. Okay, so we tried the raw version. This has been grilled. Okay. Mm. Oh my God, it's so good. Yeah. It's savory, nice crunchy peanuts, hit a scallion oil in there. God dang it. It's one of those foods where there's so many ways to prepare it, and I definitely don't like all the ways. I like about half of them. My favorite so far. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a recipe we're not gonna find in the fine dining establishment. Oysters are perceived as high-end luxury mm. food, mm. but as you've seen, ordinary coastal folks enjoy them too. Uh, about 35 cents, good deal. Yeah. Super cheap. Really good deal. So what gives? Are some oysters really better than others? Or are some patrons paying a whole lot extra for nothing? Twin and I are going undercover in our best threads to find out more, here at The Log. Chef. Chef, where home? <laughs> How would you describe the type of food you serve here? The King of Hananin. Yeah. The lock specifies in fine dining experience, serve a lot of luxury food, including seafood oysters. What makes oysters a fine dining food? First, you would look at the shell. If the shell is clean, it doesn't have a lot of stuff on it, then it would be raised far away in the ocean because when you have oyster like next to the shore, it's not very good because oh. it's too close and the water is not clean. Our first taste of the high life Oyster with caviar. And where's this oyster from? It's French origin, oh. but they made in Vietnam. Oh. <laughs> the chef washes the oysters with a combination of kick soy sauce, kumquat juice, and sugar. Add shrimp soaked in olive oil lemon sauce and top it with caviar. Fancy AF. Cheers. Okay, cheers. Mmm. Wow. That's delicious. Mmm, really good. Nice caviar on there, bringing some salt game. And then the oyster itself is just a little bit briny, but it's so meaty. Oh, I think it's so good. <laughs> no, I, no, I, <laughs> I gotta say, oysters, it's confusing. Because I eat some oysters and I'm like, how can anyone eat this? Uh -huh. And then I eat that and I think it's fantastic. Mm. What do I do? Tell him my problem. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> For him, there is no problem. He's like, I like his, so we're good. Oyster 2, a grilled French oyster with truffle sauce. Eat it together with the salmon roll. But what is it sitting on? Decoration. It's a decorative yeah. cake. Yeah. Oh, no. You can eat it, yeah. but it will taste salty. Yeah. I'm learning a lot about fine dining. You guys make cakes that you just throw away. I know, what? such a way. First, they're briefly oven cooked, making them reduce in size, priming them to soak up some new flavors. Add white beans, then squeeze on a truffle infused roux. Last, torch it. Mmm. Mm. Along with the meatiness, you taste the truffle right away. Just a little residual kind of oyster flavor. And then I'm just gonna eat some of this cake. Oh my god, he wants you. <laughs> <laughs> He's right, that's the worst cake I've ever had. Our main course contains a cornucopia of oyster creations, including the smaller French oysters and these giant imported Japanese oysters, all raw with various sauces and flavors. Which countries are most famous for their oysters? Which countries have the most expensive oysters? So he said that one's the best from France. Is there anything uh, the Vietnamese oyster could do to get a little higher on your list? In Vietnam, he would like it to be pushed the oyster farm a little further mm. to deeper water to improve the quality. Hey, putting in the water. Whoa. Ooh. Ooh. What a fancy feast. <laughs> Wow, you know, a big part of fine dining is for your food to be literally smoking. <laughs> I didn't realize that. It should almost have like a Halloween theme. These are like spooky oysters. <laughs> now we have the French oysters grown in Vietnam, but these big ones are actually from Japan. You know how they got here? In an airplane. Again? <laughs> More food that is allowed to fly during COVID-19 while I'm stuck in Vietnam. Come on. Not complaining. The first thing we should do is just try this Japanese oyster. Itadakimasu. Cheers. <laughs> Well, it's a bit much for the first date. It's a lot. I don't understand oysters. <laughs> I either love them or hate them. I'm gonna wash it down with some white wine. 
Do you want to pretend? <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't drink, so just pretend to put it to your lips. Cheers. So this one, this has caviar, a very small bird laid an egg in here. Mm, I like that. I like this one. That's good. This one has mascarpone and caviar on it. <laughs> More tolerable, cheesy, creamy. I like the caviar, but that's still a uh, It's still a lot. <laughs> it's big. When it comes to meat, whether we're talking salmon sashimi or fresh beef burger patties, we can all agree that freshness is key, mm, right? It's like the best beef you can get. Wrong. New generations of daring chefs are pushing the limits of poultry and their diner's palates. I would always heard of dry-aged beef. Mm. Can you age any kind of meat? I mean, you can within reason. What would be unreasonable? Because I never would have guessed duck. Today, we're going deep into the world of aged meat. Gotta keep that temperature nice and low. Otherwise, if it gets too hot, it'll start to age the meat a little bit too quickly than what we want. Is that just rotting? Basically. Discovering the secret techniques that go into making some of the most polarizing protein on the planet. What should we expect when we bite into this? I think you've missed a lot of things if you haven't really tried it. It's probably my favorite way of eating it. It all starts with the ducks. Guys, today, we are no longer ducking around. Sorry. Don't laugh. <laughs> it's a serious video. Today we have come southward to Vietnam's Mekong Delta to learn how they grow some of the best ducks out there. Joining me today, Dwin. Hey. Have you had duck before? Of course. I probably didn't have duck till I was in my 30s. What? Well, today we're not just having any type of duck. Mm. We're having aged duck. Have you heard oh. of this? Not really. There's a whole movement or trend behind aged meats. So they've taken duck, they'll put it in kind of a refrigerator, and it'll just hang out there for two weeks. Whoa, sounds like a lot of work. Well, I don't know if it's a lot of work. It seems like you just kind of hang just it there. Put it <laughs> Today, we're going to be exploring this whole entire process. We're going to follow these ducks from being born to, oh. uh, well, the other side of life. Are you open to tasting a duck that's been sitting in a refrigerator for three weeks? I mean, I've, I've eat bugs, so. So you're kind of open to anything, though, right? Yes. I've gotten word from a duck cooking expert that these are some of the best quality ducks you'll find anywhere. Right now, we're amongst this giant paddling of ducks. <laughs> they are so cute. They're very cute. How many ducks would you say you have in here? Oh, hang on. Around 2,000 ducks. 2,000? That's wild. Mr. Hung has been in the duck rearing business for seven years. Now he's raising about 4,000 of these little quackers at any given time. What percent is being sold to restaurants and what percent is being sold as pets? So he said mostly that these are sold for just meat. Oh, Aww, look at you. <laughs> You're sad. No, I feel nothing. Typically, going from a duckling to a ready-to-sell adult takes about eight to 10 weeks. How old are they about right now? Two weeks only. Okay, 14 days, that's pretty big. But this duck breed, originating in France, can become fully grown around six to seven weeks. They require less feed and produce higher quality protein. So there are many factors that would decide if the duck's gonna be good, but he said the DNA, it would take up to 70 to 80%. Mm. Just like Japan's Kobe beef, Good DNA is just half the battle. How they're raised matters too, ensuring they go from fluffy tweens to full-blown adults while staying healthy. This is the ducks in the adult stage. How many days old are they here? It's around 40 days. Barns are open, clean, and relatively quiet. What makes a duck a good quality duck? Then they're fed the right stuff. Yummy industrial poultry feed. He said like if he touched the breast, then he can feel that it's pretty thick. Yep. Are you checking yourself? I'm seeing if I would make a good duck. I think so. Maybe he can help me out later. We'll do that off camera. After six to seven weeks, the ducks reach a weight of about seven and a half pounds, and they're ready to ship off. How much are you selling the duck for here? 100,000 Vietnam dong. For a whole duck? Yes. The duck we're going to be trying later today, I think it's like half the duck is around $25. Does that seem like a lot to you? Eating duck is common in Vietnam. Uh, he said it's really high. Around just about any corner, you could find it roasted, eaten with noodles or stewed in a savory broth. Have you ever heard of a preparation like aged duck meat? But aged duck? Yeah. He said he never heard of it. This is a pretty foreign concept. 
The meat preparation method dates back centuries. Back in the early 1900s, they'd store the animals as a half carcass in the big refrigerated rooms. That's how they get more life out of the animal. Now it makes frequent appearances on gourmet menus, especially in Europe and big town USA. You should be able to pick up like a bit of cheesiness and a bit of hamminess and a certain kind of nastiness as well. Meet George, executive chef of Stoker Woodfire Grill for the last three years. He's mastered the art of cooking aged meats, creating one of this city's most unique dining experiences. Would you consider this a fine dining restaurant? Am I overdressed or properly dressed? <laughs> it's more just refined rather than fine dining. Oh. It seems like aged meats happen to be associated with kind of fine dining or higher end restaurants. Mm. When I learned about this, I felt like I won the lottery because I have a lot of aged meat in my refrigerator. <laughs> Sandwich meat, turkey, old pastrami. Yep. It's been aging a, a long time. <laughs> so you have a steak right here. We are. So this is a 30 day dry aged porterhouse. It's gra gra finished on grain. So you get a bit more of a fat content through it. This gets imported from Australia. Then it sits in the refrigerator for 30 days. When it starts resembling a giant stick of beef jerky, it's ready to eat. What is the most aged beef you've ever heard of? I've seen 365 day dry aged short loins and it looks like a fossil. A year? It's a year. almost a year. A year. Would you eat that? Maybe. <laughs> The demonic dark outer skin is cut away, revealing a more familiar steak color and texture. He seasoned with salt and olive oil and grills on an open fire for five minutes. Take it off for a five minute breather, then repeat a couple more times until this wise old steak is ready to eat. I've tried aged beef before. To me, it was real funky. Is that how it's supposed to be? It can be. Um, so after 30 days, it starts to develop a lot more stronger flavors. You'll get a lot more like blue cheese and nutty notes to it. It's even more pungent, more powerful? Normally, yes. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm real excited. I'm gonna be honest, I'm scared. But let's just try it. I'm gonna get kind of a medium piece here. Oh, it smells fantastic. A little smoky. I think we should eat it at some point. Ready? Oh, Cheers. Did. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That's delicious. Thank you very much. That's real good. It's smoky, it's heavy, the fat is delicious. How was it for you? Just delicious. I'm telling you, what I've had in the past, it was mm. funky. Mm. Yeah. And this is nothing but pleasant. No funk at all. Right. So I should just try one more piece to be sure that. <laughs> Freak, that's good. I love it. The only main difference I can tell mm. is that the texture feels different. Right. It feels almost a bit more dense. Kind of a unique texture that's fun to bite through. How does the aging affect the texture? Um, so as it gets older, it'll start to firm up because it loses its water. Mm. It will also start to get a bit more tender. So it gets tender and firm? Mm. It almost, almost hammy. Good things come to those who wait. Enzymes and changes in water composition, transforming the meat's texture and mouthfeel. Like my hairline, <laughs> the meat is experiencing a controlled decomposition. George, yeah. right now we're in uh, your giant refrigerator, but I've been in bigger ones where you can kind of walk around. <laughs> but no, it's nice. It's cozy, quaint. The conditions for this method are simple, but must be precise. The space should be well ventilated. Moisture is then pulled from the meat over time. I'm looking around, I'm seeing uh, this. What's this? Is Probably should be seeing that one there. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't see that. Is that a giant tootsie roll? Is that butter? We coat it in rendered beef fat just to limit that moisture loss a bit more. Natural enzymes within the meat come alive and start breaking down the molecular bonds. This alters the flavor and texture. We're here mainly for the duck. Already today we went to a duck farm. The farmer was talking a lot about the breasts. He seemed to be a big fan. He said they're very full. Yes, they are. How long are you going to age a duck? So for special events, we'll take it to three weeks. Minimum is uh, 15 days. The duck is roasted for two hours, constantly basting in a mixture of butter, vinegar, and garlic every 20 minutes. Let me hold you, cause life without you feels so Next, George grills it in the oven, spraying on sherry vinegar to help crispify the duck skin. What is the experience gonna be as I bite down into a three week aged duck? It's gonna be gamey, so a bit of cheesy, a bit funky. A funky duck, this is exciting, okay. <laughs> Pop off the duck breast and thigh and grill. Slice it into bite-sized pieces and plate. 
It's garnished with caramelized apple chunks and a touch of vinegar sauce. Hey, it's us. Yes. Have you seen a better looking duck than this? It looks fantastic. It is. And so this one has been aged for two weeks and it's covered, what is this, like caramelized apple? Mmm, I like that. That's kind of a weird start to a duck meal though. <laughs> Let's jump into it. The meat itself looks fairly pinkish, and the skin is nice and dark. It smells great. There's some queen's vinegar on there. I don't Ooh. know what that means, but that's what's on there. Let's go for it. I'm searching for the gaminess. So I'm searching for that cheese. What the duck? <laughs> it's really yummy. There's nothing like funky here though. It's not gamey at, like, at all. It's different than normal duck though, right? I mean, I'm sure you've had roasted duck or duck made in the Chinese way a thousand times. Oh, because sorry. I look Chinese. <laughs> okay, you know what? I know you would take it the wrong way. Because the Chinese people know how to make freaking duck. Mm, juicy, tender. Mm. It's not as dense as the other beef that we have in the kitchen. It's ducking good. Holy ducking shit. <laughs> oh, what's I said shit. Now, today we're gonna be trying two different ducks. Duck that is aged two weeks and duck that's aged three weeks. Usually, people don't get the three week one because it's too intense. So I wanted to get the intense variety so we can compare it against this. Like making blue cheese, the process of dry aging meat promotes the growth of certain fungal species. Sounds tasty, right? Can you age any kind of meat? It really just depends on how far you go with it. Duck definitely can, chicken I wouldn't. What are you worried about with chicken? A salmonella mainly. <laughs> oh. Over time, it reaches maturity, but the longer you go. Right here we have our three week Aged duck. The more intense the flavors will become. I want you to fork that and just. Hold on. Oh, smell that. Smell that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. This is what you've been waiting for all Whoa. day. This is like stinky Here we tofu. Go. But you kind of like it, don't you? Yeah, kind of like, oh, oh, <laughs> right? it's bad. It's so bad, it's good. <laughs> it looks a little different, like it's discoloration. Fading. Yeah, let's try it out. Cheers. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah, but I, I think I like it. It's an offensive aroma. It's bold, it's daring. The smell is a bit more intense than the actual experience of eating it. Oh, damn. You kind of take in more of that decomposition of the oh. tissue, but then when you eat it, it's not as intense as the smell. When you mix that with the sweetness and the sourness of the sauce, it kind of works together. It's pretty strong for me. <laughs> Too much for you? Because when we eat the two weeks, it's not that clear. You can still taste like normal duck. So I think mm. maybe one more week, like no big deal. But it's big deal. <laughs> yeah, so this is like your absolute limit. <laughs> yeah, what an experience. Dry aged meat. Don't try making it in your fridge like me. Leave it to the pros. Yourself. This is profound. <laughs> Start with the young stuff, and if that tickles your tongue, work your way up to the more aggressive flavors. I like the two-week aged duck, mm -hmm. but I respect the three-week aged duck. Wow. It's not for everyone. I think it's good, but if it's like aged a little more, like one day more, then I'll be like, mm. <laughs> If one day your palate grows weary of pedestrian proteins, there's always something more extreme ahead. Shrimpies. One shrimp is sticking his little arm up. Oh! They're like the poor man's lobster. If you had to choose between one lobster or eight shrimp. Here in Southeast Asia. God, what the? Oh. They come in every shape. Oh, wow. Size. Oh, my God. Whoa. And price. Around 10 bucks at a shrimp. Three to four times the other shrimp we just had. <laughs> today, we're going deep into the world of shrimp. Joining me today, do it. Yay. Hey. Venturing far outside the city to a shrimp farm. Oh no, it came back to life! I want to see how locals cook up this tasty treat. Oh my god. Compared to one of the most premium, high-end restaurants in town. Do you know what makes these so expensive? It all starts right here. Today we are in Vietnam's Mekong Delta, a place that's famous for growing shrimpies. And it's actually very rare that we're able to film here. You see, there's some interesting kind of spiritual belief here that if you have people come and film, all your shrimp will die. Really? Yeah. These shrimps are like extremely camera shy. This is not a joke. When it comes to filming permission, we've been refused by over 20 different farmers, all for this reason. Xin Chao An. Luckily, this man allowed us onto his farm, regardless of this superstitious risk. That rumor is kind of go a long way already. We convinced him using sound reason and plenty of cash. I'm glad that money can cure all that ails us. 
Worldwide, there are 2,000 different species of shrimp. Some are pretty and some are monstrous. Have you ever had some fancy shrimp? Like lost, like shrimp, I don't know. Yeah. What's the biggest shrimp you've ever had? <laughs> that, okay, that's a pretty good shrimp. Here in Asia, they're producing 75% of the shrimp the entire world consumes. And most of that shrimp is raised on a farm. Farms are easier, cheaper, and a better option for controlling quality. It's no different for today's unique blue-handed river prawn. This particular river prawn, it doesn't really produce a lot of profit, but you can get profit all year long. Okay, so it might not be the most money, but it's a safe bet overall. Exactly. This is one of the most commonly eaten shrimp in Vietnam. These little guys tend to be pretty low maintenance, as long as you make sure they have enough oxygen, food, and that their living space is clean. Why is this such a good place to have a shrimp farm? Yeah. First is weather. So it's only had two seasons, like rainy and sunny, that's it. And second thing, it would be the water. It has to be like a little salty only, right. like five to 10 out of a thousand. Mr. Fei starts the shrimp rearing by dumping 100,000 two-day-old shrimp into one of his ponds. So what are these? Fish, natural fish. Natural fish? Yeah, he didn't put any fish here. It just happened to be there, very wow. convenient. <laughs> you can see the difference in size from the two-day-old shrimp to the 14-day-old shrimp. They are seriously tiny. It's pretty cute, but I don't think I get full with that. It would take around four to seven months to sell. That's way longer than I thought. Yeah, I mean, it's so small. Yeah, you want to hold it? Did you kill it? Uh, I hugged it <laughs> with my fingers and I took its breath away. Oh my god. Oops. Oh no, it came back to life and it oh, jumped. Yes, he was playing dead. To put even more fat on their bones, these shrimp stay here for a full seven months before heading to the. <laughs> Ooh. Before heading to the market. These river prawns are some of my favorite shrimps ever. I just didn't see it for most of my life. I'm sure you're used to it, it's no big deal. Yeah. But the fact that they have big, spooky blue arms is amazing to me, yes. That, oh my god, that's their phone. Okay, either that they got a phone call or North Korea is attacking. Seafood, seafood, seafood. Mr. Tan has been managing his own seafood supply for 25 years. One shrimp is sticking his little arm. Oh my god! <clears throat> Uh, I mean, I got scared. That freaked me out. Offering a fresh selection from all over Vietnam, but this is his best-selling item. The river prawn from the Mekong Delta. Right there. Oh my God. Yes, okay. I'm saying, oh, he's missing one claw. That's a big shrimp. <laughs> Feel this claw. It's like a wet carpet. Oh, oh ew. Do it again. <laughs> oh my God. Whoa, this one is Aside from river prawns, local folks also commonly eat what the rest of the world eats, like these white leg shrimp and tiger shrimp. Oh, these have a beautiful stripe pattern on their back, hence the name oh. tiger prawn. It's one of the most commonly farm-raised shrimp anywhere. Most of the shrimpies you see here have never ventured into the wild. These guys are all farm-raised. In fact, 98% of all the shrimp you eat come from a pond farm somewhere, and only about 2% are wild-caught. This monstrosity is one of the wild ones. This one is a mantis shrimp. Mantis shrimp. Now, I actually, I have tried the mantis shrimp before in Hong Kong. Ooh, a little flashback. Oh, they caught some plastic. Because they don't want them to fight with each other. The owner takes a moment to swing by and inform us, <laughs> which means it's very powerful. Oh. So, can it hurt you? Oh, yeah. What does it feel like? Chun <laughs> Oh, yeah, it had a hole. It went right through. And we're back. Okay. So, actually, this isn't the same mantis I tried in Hong Kong. There are over 400 mantis species, and this is one of them. Oh, oh my god. That's his arm. Oh. Instead of a dangerous punching fist, these guys are equipped with some seriously spiky arms, resembling that of a praying mantis. So they're still not to be messed with. This is nearly three to four times the price. It's very tough to raise them in the farm because they have to be consistently in really cold water, and there's a lot of technology to be involved to raise them to this size, so it's right. very hard. Bought straight from the market, this food is already pricey. But before we see it get the high-end treatment, I want to see what local eateries are doing with this fancy food. Right now, um, 
We're here in an abandoned factory. It's a large space. It kind of has a cool industrial vibe, like big fans, and they have a fish tank behind you hey. over there. Baba Bao Restaurant is offering a tank-to-table dining experience, specializing in river prawn hot pot and all kinds of seafood. But I've got a better idea. People don't usually do this, but today we brought our own seafood here. This is great. I've never seen this preparation before. Can you tell what he's done to cook it? He didn't cook it. <laughs> That's right. Our first meal of the day is prepared green. That means the shrimp is raw. That's right. We challenged this chef to push his creative culinary skills. And what did he do? Well, almost nothing, but that's on me. He's just kind of stripped the tail away, and then he's left the head, so you're like, ah, right, it's a uh, shrimp. We like to resemble stuff back together. Yeah, I like that. Oh, now that is pretty big for eating raw. Oh my god. Give it a little bit of a dip. What do you think? That's a bit big for eating raw. Yeah. It's so fresh and it is so firm. Yeah. I couldn't even bite through it. Right. I'm going to take a smaller bite this time. Okay, let's do. Mm -hmm. It is softer. It's like tender. But the meat itself is kind of stringy. And so I wonder if that's because it's old. People say lobster when it gets really big or old. It's not ideal. So I wonder if that's the same. But overall fun. I think this would be a good drinking food. Yeah. 100%. And our final course. Damn. <laughs> Our second dish features these praying mantis shrimp. First, he removes the sharp, dangerous bits, but keeps the cool parts. These guys have never been in the deep sea, but at least now they're getting deep fried. Then stir fry, along with fried pork fat, chili sauce, garlic, more garlic, and actually, more garlic. That is huge. It's not a shrimp. It's alien looking. I gotta be honest, I'm not a huge fan of this kind of shrimp. What is what that? It's got teeth on its arms. You put your thumb in here, it'll make you regret it. Look at this. this! That's the part. It's like, it's weird to get it out. It's hard to get it out. All right. Oh, wow! That's a clean one. I'm gonna put some of these pork and garlic crumbles inside the body cavity like it's a little shrimp taco. Cheers. That strong, like aquarium taste to it. Actually, it tastes like crab meat to me. I mean, it's got a hint of that crabby kind of sweetness. It's still a bit mushy, the texture. It's not like a normal bouncy shrimp. Overall, pretty good. I think it's really good. Yeah. Is that worth paying three to four times the other shrimp we just had? Okay, now you're ruining it for me. <laughs> I think it's good, but it's not that expensive. Shouldn't be. I don't think that it can be made much better than this. Even here in this abandoned warehouse looking restaurant, this big pile of shrimp comes in at $83. It's an expensive ingredient, no matter where you are. But now, we're headed to one of the classiest spots in town, seeing how they turn up the heat and the price on this tasty treat. Our final destination, Square One. Chef. Sunny. Located inside the Park Hyatt Hotel. Here, they're offering high quality food with a luxurious backdrop. What do you like about working with shrimp in the kitchen? Personally, I love shrimp. For me, it comes down to the cooking technique. Whether you overcook it and make it tough, or you undercook it and it's raw for the wrong kind of prawn, whatever it is, to cook it with some respect. What is the wrong kind of prawn to have raw? Because we just had the river prawns. We, not really, you shouldn't eat those raw, yeah. I knew no, he was no. gonna say that, because it's fresh water. We got parasites. Did it come from the river or? It was farm raised. You should be fine. Should, hey, we should be fine. We'll know within a couple, <laughs> of, a couple of hours. Oh boy. Oh, it's coming soon. Let's talk about another type of shrimp we have haven't covered yet, the carabinero. Carabinero. The carabinero. Yes. This comes from the Mediterranean, around Spain. It's one of the most expensive shrimp in the world. It's right here, I'm looking at it. This expensive delicacy is one of the world's most coveted prawns, renowned for their size and their color, which they get by feeding on pink plankton. These are actually recommended to eat raw. It's one of my favorites, this one. Here, these fancy imported shrimpies are slightly torched for 10 seconds. Do you know what makes these so expensive? It comes down to consumer demand. There's a business behind it as well, but for sure these, amazing taste. I think when you try them, it should be part of the explanation why they're so expensive. Okay. Then the chef places it on an oyster shell and tops it with hamon imberico, one of the finest hams in the world. Okay, so what does the foam do? It's a flavor. It's made out of a Hokkaido scallop. We make it just like a cappuccino. Just like a scallop cappuccino. Okay. I feel fancy. That's a great visual, yeah. Cheers, guys. Oh, wow. 
wow. Wonderful soft texture, no stringiness, and there's oyster in there. There is. We take the oyster and we make it into an emulsion, similar to a mayonnaise. Is this your own creation? It is. I like it, big fan. Can I have 12 more? <laughs> For our climactic shrimp dining experience, we'll see the humble river prawn served two ways. Now, how elegant is this? Huh? So let's talk about it. First, Jasper grilled prawns. Step one, put a stick up its butt area and roast. Remove the shell and place it atop a bisque. Eat with caviar and an herb emulsion. Imagine if they just like boiled your body liquids and then they put your body like on top of the body liquids. That's what they've done here with the shrimp. That's a good bite. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. The sauce is kind of gentle, buttery, almost creamy, with plenty of that shrimpy essence in it. It's not super powerful. And you can see here, like, the shrimp is not cooked. It's still, like, you can have that firm texture still of the mm. raw shrimp, right? I think that this kind of shrimp is just kind of a stringy shrimp. Yeah. I don't really mind it. It's mm. fine. But overall good, yeah? I would like more of them. <laughs> That's the whole point of fine dining. Yeah, I know. Something happened from the abandoned warehouse. Six giant shrimp, and then we're here. We have one shrimp. One. Our final dish has led us here, the caramelized river prawn. This is a more Vietnamese inspiration going into this dish. First, making the caramel sauce. A combination of sugar and vegetables, along with fish sauce and soy sauce, begin to cook down. On the side, the shrimps are blanched with onion and ginger. Add coconut oil, the sauce, leeks, and finally, sneak in some chili and peppercorns. Oh, it's got a giant head and a little... So I'm gonna pull, oh, the tail kind of comes pretty easily. Cheers. Mmm, that might be my favorite yet. Oh, wow. So to me, that tastes much more traditionally shrimpy. Great, dense, bouncy texture, cooked all the way through. Very satisfying. Great comfort food. I don't know if it's supposed to be. Well, do you feel comforted? Yeah, like, it's like warm. When you eat it together with rice, I think, yeah, like a family vibe, I would say. Yeah. Right, a good sharing food, if you had more meat to share. <laughs> Shrimp. It's one of those foods like oysters where it's kind of everywhere, whether you're at a super local market, a street food stall, or a place like this. Kind of everybody has access to shrimp, but it's all about what you do with the shrimp. I'm curious if the people watching this would consider this a fancy food or just a normal meat, but to me, it still feels fancy. Maybe that's because when I was a kid, I was in the Midwest, far from the ocean, and it was just hard to get my hands on shrimp. Eating shrimp cocktail like once a year at Christmas was like, <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but for you, you grew up with shrimp. Uh, I'm surprised. Like the first one, I never thought of making shrimp that way. So I do believe that to make it feel fine dining, then it has to do a lot with the cooking technique as well, and not just uh, the ingredient itself. I totally agree. Shrimp cocktail ain't got nothing on shrimp in Asia. Once you get outside, boring old traditional shrimp, there's a world of possibilities you never knew existed. A mushroom is a fleshy, spore-bearing, fruiting body of a fungus. They can poison you. They can heal you. It can help stop the spreading of cancer. Or they can give you one of the finest dining experiences known to man. Mm. Oh, that stole my heart. Today, we're digging deep into the world of mushrooms. Do they have a magic mushroom college? Seeing how these fun guys are grown in factories. This is what my bologna looked like in college. From super affordable. I thought it would be dusty. Not dusty. It's self-cleaning. To ungodly expensive. This is what Oprah eats. We'll be uncovering the vast array of mushrooms that exist in Asia. They actually have like 60 high of mushrooms. And around the world. That's what God's breath smells like. <laughs> and it all starts now. Mushrooms. They don't come from animals, so why should we care? Today, I'm with Twin to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> Today, Twin and I will be diving into the wide-ranging world of mushrooms, from the cheapest. I like that one, because it's like squishy. All the way to the most expensive you can find anywhere. So this is yeah. super expensive. It's super expensive. So we have a long journey ahead of us, but first, we're heading to the hot pot store. Welcome to Ashima. With 15 years in the hot pot business and over 60 kinds of mushrooms on their menu, they are the go-to spot for all things hot. Pot. The cornerstone to any good hot pot experience is the broth. So I'm gonna put my spoon in there. Very complex. Very nice. Over here, the mushrooms. 
Now, usually you wouldn't really order this many mushrooms, but they wanted to show us the huge variety they have here and they have outdone themselves. This is wild. First of all, these are the oyster mushrooms. But before we get too deep into this, I want to go to an oyster mushroom farm. Oh, really? And we're there now. These are the oyster mushrooms. Have you had these before? In a soup, maybe. Oh, you never just stood by a wall of them like this? <laughs> yeah, I know. These guys are one of the most common and easy to produce mushrooms in Vietnam. What do you think makes an oyster mushroom different from other mushrooms? I think the texture is quite good, and when you put it in the hot pot, it doesn't get so soggy. Yeah. But before I have a taste, I want to learn more about where these fungi come from with mushroom farmer, Mr. Jung. Sir, how you doing? On his humble farm, he grows over 200,000 embryos and five different kinds of mushrooms. Uh, right now, we're standing next to a bunch of embryo bags. It's a fun name, right? Embryo, embryo bags. bags. Here, like on many farms, the mushrooms are grown in reusable plastic vessels filled with sawdust and mushroom spawn. The only two ingredients needed to grow a healthy mycelium. So he said these are actually the fibers of the mushroom. Almost like tree roots? Yes, yes, yes. Each mushroom's mycelium grows at a different pace. The oyster mushroom takes about 60 days to go from this to this. This will be the base for the mushroom to grow later. When it's fully matured, the bottle cap is removed, allowing the mushroom to sprout forth in the coming weeks. All right, can we eat your oyster mushrooms? Yeah, you can eat it like right away. Let's do it. Mm. All right, ready? Ready. Mmm. There's almost like this fibrous fan texture on the back of the mushroom that gives it a nice gushy kind of taste as you chomp through it. Very good. So that is how they make oyster mushrooms. Mm. And we're back from the farm. Next on our hit list. Enoki mushroom. Enoki mushrooms, or needle mushrooms, are a popular ingredient all over East Asia, especially in Japan. I'd really like to learn more about these. I don't have any information, so where can we go? How about a mushroom factory? Oh, nice! Let's go. <laughs> to learn more about the needle mushroom farming process, we've come to Kinoko Factory, a place where these guys are produced on a massive scale. Oh, Miss Wei! Oh. Xin Xiao! Xin Xiao! The woman behind this magic mushroom operation, Miss Tu Hui. With 16 years of mushroom experience, she's adopted and applied methods and technologies from Japan, which allows her to produce cleaner and safer mushrooms with less environmental impact. Right now we are in your mushroom factory, and I'm a huge fan of mushrooms. All types of mushrooms. How many mushrooms are coming out of this place? So it would be 1,000 tons every year. Really? To produce needle mushrooms on such a large scale, nearly everything must be automated. It starts with a glass cup filled with mushroom compost made from bran, corn cob, sugar cane, radish, beets, and corn. The sealed vessels are sent to a steamer for pasteurization, killing any pests or bacteria. After eight hours of steaming, these vessels are moved to a machine that fills them with mushroom spawn. Then they're stacked in this warehouse, where they grow mycelium for the next 23 days. There's about, I don't know, one billion mushroom jars in here. Here, a mushroom specialist, Mr. Nim, will watch over his little babies to ensure their quality. Do you check the quality by tasting it ever? Because that's kind of my dream job. No, okay, we should go. Yeah. <laughs> Once the mycelium stretches through the entire vessel, the cap is removed to allow the mushrooms to spring forth. When the mushroom caps are formed, the jar tops are manually wrapped with a measuring cone to ensure the mushrooms are the same size when they leave the factory. Once mushrooms grow to the edge of the measuring cone, they're ready to harvest. Each mushroom is weighed, then put on a conveyor belt and sent to packaging. Can I try some of this right now? Yeah, can. Yeah. Okay, I just broke off a piece. <laughs> that's, that's too much. <laughs> it's too much? Yeah, he said it's too much. <laughs> It's earthy, and really, the best part about this kind of mushroom is the texture. It has a certain, like, squeakiness as you chew through it. I love it. Well, from here, I think we got some mushrooms to eat, young lady. <laughs> so, we got to try the mushrooms in the factory. Now we're gonna try them for realsies. Mm. 
Oh. Mm -hmm. Like crackers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really cool. That is my favorite thing about these. They have this like crazy squeaky crunch. From here, we're going to the kitchen because there are two more mushrooms the chef here is going to tell us about. Great. Let's go now. I'm not going to teleport. We can just take the stairs. Hello, chef. Meet the head of the kitchen, Mr. Duan, the keeper of the most unique and most expensive mushrooms you'll find in any of the top hot pot spots. What is this called in Vietnamese? Nam Tu Cao. There are two names. One is after a flower, and the other one snow mushroom. Oh, I like that one. It feels great. They say that when you walk in nature, it automatically de-stresses you, and I feel like this also de-stresses you. Oh, it's nice. Yeah. It's one of my favorite mushrooms. It's super unique. It seems like it belongs on a, a coral reef underwater on the Great Barrier Reef outside of Australia. It's awesome. This is one of their most unique mushrooms, but I want to try their most expensive one and see if the price can compare to truffles. Now, this is a, a much more traditional mushroom shape. Hello? <laughs> So, oh, I don't speak Vietnamese. Um, do you, it's for you. Oh my god, you really did that. Hello, I can't believe you make up that phone. My staff called me. Is everything okay? Everything is okay. Back to the mushrooms. This is the Matsutake mushroom. It's also known as the Queen's Up mushroom. Due to its very specific growth requirements, this only grow at the roots of some trees. And then it has to be foggy all year round. It's one of the most expensive mushrooms in the world. What makes this mushroom so unique and so rare? This one is very special because it used to be served to the royals in Japan. And you can only get this mushroom for 30 to 40 days every year. All right, all right thanks for all the help. We're very excited to, should I, you got it? All right, that's fine, take the call. We're gonna go eat, thank you. Right here, this is the snow mushroom, one of my absolute favorites, crazy texture. All right, you ready? Let's go yes. for it. let's go. Isn't this so weird? It's so weird. So it's a little spongy, it's a little chewy, confusing, exciting. It's like your first crush in high school. You feel nervous, but you feel good too. I actually like it. Right? Yeah. It's really good. There's one more mushroom we want to focus on here, these guys. It's not as expensive as truffle, but when you eat truffle, you can't even have a whole mushroom. They will shave you part of a mushroom and that's it. But here, we can actually enjoy some full mushrooms. Should you try it out? Oh, wow. Oh. What? Whoa. <laughs> yeah, what? It's almost like eating just wood in mushroom form. Kind of soggy texture. Like you can bite through that. See, you can see my teeth mm -hmm. on there. Oof, that's an intense one. No, I like that. It's really nice. This is one of the most expensive fungi in Asia, but I want to try eating the most expensive mushroom in the world, the truffle. So Chuin brought us here. Garden des Sens, or Garden of Senses. A mix of traditional and modern fine dining with Chef Frederick at the helm. Chef, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. And yourself? We're great. Today, we're covering mushrooms. We've come here to explore the most expensive mushroom in the world, the truffle. Truffle is a type of mushroom that grow underground. It's one of the most popular ingredients in fine dining cuisine and an easy way to kick up the price of any meal. Why do people like truffles so much? Because it's very expensive. I mean, a few years ago, it was really a privilege of people who can afford it. But then with the time, everybody could buy them and taste them and eat them. Yeah, it's interesting because in my 20s, I never tried truffle anything, but these days, Maybe with the advent of uh, truffle oil, now there's truffle everything. But something happened to me a while ago where I actually tried a real truffle and it didn't taste like the truffle oil and I knew something was amiss. Does truffle oil actually have truffle in it? No. Oh my god! Son it's of a gun! Alive. There are hundreds of truffle species, but only about 10 are edible. Here, they have three varieties in stock. Oh my God, smell it. Wow. That's what God's breath smells like. <laughs> Burgundy, known for its hazelnut flavor. Oh. oh. 
Wow, it's gorgeous on the inside, like a roadmap to my heart. Black, often used for cooking, as it better retains its flavor. After it's cooked, it develops the aroma. And white, this is the most expensive truffle here. $6,000 for one kilo. So I think that to offer to Madame on a ring should be beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, it's always been a dream of mine to eat a truffle like an apple. You're not going really to appreciate it. You can do it. I can do it? Yes, of course. All right, I'm going for it. Huh, aromatic, very nutty, not as moist as I thought. It makes my mouth feel a little dry, or like a hard, delicious styrofoam. This is why most fantasies should just remain fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> Our first dish, chicken ramelade. Starting with the filling. Combine chicken mousse with chicken liver. Then add chicken breast, pork fat, and black truffle cubes. Spread out the chicken breast filet. Then top it with a generous layer of filling. French pigeon breasts, foie gras, and more mushrooms. Finally, wrap it up and sous vide for three hours at 145 degrees. Actually, there's no truffle yet. There's a truffleman who's gonna come and shave it for us. Oh, the chef himself. Oh. Yes. That is a lot, that's fantastic. It smells so good. I feel butterflies in my stomach. Let's try it out. Mmm. Wow, that's one moist loaf. It's like very delicately seasoned. As I'm eating it, I don't get a huge truffle sensation. I swear it's almost more of something you smell than something you taste. It's interesting because as he's doing the shavings, like that is the moment of climax. After that, there's not much to it, but I still like it. It still makes me feel like a fancy boy. Fancy boy. Course two, Hokkaido scallops with a side of broccoli ice cream. The scallop is seared on both sides, then served with a spinach puree, home day cheese, spinach, and truffle oil. Serve with a side of ice cream made from broccoli that's been topped with deep fried bacon bits. Wow, that's a mountain of truffle. It's a lot of truffle that I cannot see the scallop anymore. It looks great. <laughs> Yay! Cheers! Cheers! It's just so good, I'm speechless. Scallop alone is beautiful. It's just plump, kind of naturally sweet, but it's a perfect match for the truffle. So far, we've had two dishes with truffle. Do you think it's worth the hype? Yes! Really? <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Yeah, wonderfully married together. On the side here, something that you wouldn't expect to be married together, broccoli ice cream. Dish, macaroni risotto with the most expensive truffle uh, we could find in this city. <laughs> Cook the macaroni, then put it on ice. In a separate pan, fry up garlic and onions. Add white beans, water, rosemary, and let that simmer. Sear onions, garlic, and sun-dried tomatoes. Add water, macaroni, butter, and finally, finish with an artichoke heart. Mix in the beans and plate with more sun-dried tomatoes, scallions, Parmesan cheese, basil, and finally, top it with slices of freshly grated, very expensive white truffle. We've kind of leveled up to the white truffle, the most expensive one they have here. Cheers. 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 Oh, that stole my heart. It's like a fancy comfort food. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is more reminiscent of what I've had in foods that have truffle oil. Yes. A little more potent, a little stronger flavor, and uh, you kind of feel it more in the nostrils. Which truffle do you like more? I think it's hard to say because this one has got the blend in with the food already, but this white one, very strong. So I, I think I like it more. Yeah, I think I like it more too. I like the flavor to hit me like a truck, and so I appreciate the more intense flavor of the white truffle. Mushrooms, they add so much to food and to cooking, whether it's texture, it has a certain like squeakiness as you chew through it. And then they all just have a really, a pretty dramatically different taste to them. All the tastes of the forest. After today, I appreciate all mushrooms more. And to me, a mushroom doesn't have to be expensive to get my attention. Dude, where did you come from? Here's to fungus. <laughs> 
Mushrooms are bay. There are hundreds of different mushroom species eaten around the globe. What? And it's a crime that more of them aren't commonly available to folks in the USA. This is all we really ate growing up. But if you're watching this now, know that you can scour the mushroom section of your Whole Foods or local Asian grocery store to take home some not so common fungi. Today, we're going far from fancy restaurants or city streets. Where the flip are we? Ha, we're in the middle of nowhere, really. Visiting a rarely seen caviar factory. Can I eat one of these? No, you shouldn't. I wouldn't. He always <laughs> I want to see where this stuff really comes from and learn why folks are willing to pay so much for so little. Wow, um, I dropped nice. a bunch of eggs. I did too. It's also rude to not pick these off the table. It all starts right here. Jonathan, hey, how you doing? Hey, it's a pleasure to have you here. This place is something you don't see every day. This is the top of Dala. We actually have two farms. We have the sturgeon farm that produces caviar, and we have the sturgeon farm that produces the sturgeon meat that we sell as well. Set on a mountainside built downstream from a natural waterfall, you'll find the origin of Vietnamese-made caviar, boasting over 10,000 fish. So first of all, caviar, yep. is that just any type of fish egg? Today we're joined by Jonathan, executive director of Caspiar Caviar, one of the companies selling the caviar produced at this farm. Well, caviar means fish eggs, period. But the term caviar has been synonymous with the high-end luxury fish eggs only from sturgeon from the Caspian Sea. Now, because fishing is illegal, we raise them. Due to overfishing, catching sturgeon in the wild is illegal. But where there's limitations, there's innovation. With caviar, why is it so dang expensive? Ah, well, that's one of the most easiest questions to answer. Okay, good. There are four types of popular sturgeon species that produce top quality caviar. Beluga, Asietra, Sevruga, and Sterling. The average age of our sturgeon is eight years to have caviar. Wow. This farm began with just Sterling back in 2008, and they didn't harvest any eggs until 2017, nine years later. How old are you when you first tried it? 25. Are you 25 right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about salmon roe? Yeah, yeah, many times. So why is something like salmon roe so much cheaper? Well, a salmon after eight months has roe. Oh, it just takes eight months. Yeah. yeah. These sturgeon, imported straight from the Caspian Sea, are raised here for at least five years before they start developing eggs. You never know for certain when a fish will spawn or lay its eggs. Each fish spawn at a different time. So the only way to do that is to do an ultrasound. And so today we're going to do an ultrasound for you. Okay, can you name all the foods in your life you've eaten that have been ultrasounded? First one for I think me. my mom had ultrasound, I don't know. But you are not food. <laughs> What is he looking for? So he's looking for the outline of the egg sac because the eggs, it's transparent. But the egg sac is a membrane, and so you can see the membrane. Oh, oh, oh. Shoves it in there about two or three inches. He's gonna disinfect the hole. When they release it back in the water, it'll actually heal. Wow, these fish are tough. The eggs for this fish came out, it's not ready yet. When it turns darker, then it gets ready. Can I eat one of these? No, you shouldn't, I wouldn't. Probably 25 cents of caviar right here. Each fish is carefully monitored, keeping track of their egg development. I think the fish is fine, they probably like it. So these eggs are actually ready. Right, it's kind of a grayish blue. Exactly, in about three months it will spawn. So we have to take the roe out before it spawns. Um, can I eat these? You can try. Okay. They have no flavor. Then why are they so expensive? <laughs> this would be good if I had like a tequila shot. Do the tequila, lick the eggs. It just tastes like fish oil. Yeah, pretty much. I don't regret it. Mm. Okay, good. Can somebody call the emergency room, please? <laughs> To begin processing the caviar, the traditional Russian technique is employed. He's disinfecting the fish. The fish is so clean, you could literally eat off it right now. Box cutter to the gut. The color is amazing. It's this really brilliant, interesting, kind of grayish blue color. It looks really awesome. Each pound could cost up to $800, but this price isn't even close to the most rare prized caviar available on the market. This is the most expensive fish in the world. Really? Yes. These are albino sturgeon. There's only three farms in the world that actually have these that I know of. $10,000 a kilogram. Wow. Is there any difference in the flavor or do people just like the fact that it's so rare and unusual? There is a difference in the flavor and the color. The color is absolutely white and gold. Are we gonna be able to try this today? Do you have $10,000 on you? <laughs> uh, I could get a bank loan. Well, here we are, what a fancy location. Here we are. Today we're sampling the more traditional Caspiar Imperial Black Caviar and the even more rare 
more expensive Sundale Golden Albino Caviar. Just another sunny day. So the last thing I saw in person was them cutting the fish and then moving the eggs into a bowl. Can you tell us what happens between there and here? What they'll do is they'll have a tammy, sort of like a sieve, and they'll actually roll the egg sac so all the individual eggs come out. Then they wash it and then they'll carefully measure salt. Our salt is actually imported salt. And then we'll put it into big tins. We'll let it age for about three days. Then we individually put it into each tin and we vacuum seal it. Today, I'm going to show you guys how to eat caviar on the fly. Great. Ha. Ah, now, hold out your left hand, all right, upwards, and then make a small fist like this. This is how people eat caviar at a party. Yeah, I did not know that. When you eat it, put it onto your tongue, and you let it sit for about three seconds, and you slowly push it up to the roof of your mouth, the eggs would separate by itself. I've always just been seeing how fast I could eat it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go. Wow. Mm, and I'm not drunk this time. I'm usually pretty drunk if I'm ordering caviar. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It's really nice. This has a very distinct cashew finish, where others are peanut or almonds. Right. The water in our farm creates this flavor. I didn't know that my hand can be like the utensil. The serving, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is. Here, albino sturgeon. I mean, completely different, a world yeah. apart, even though it's from the same species of same fish. Same species, same fish. They call this on the street, white pearls. On the streets. On the streets. Yeah, I don't know what streets you grew up on. <laughs> what you're gonna taste is the same, but at the end there's gonna be a light, salty citrus burst. You ready for that? Mm. Let's right. burst, shall we? Cheers. 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 Did you get the citrus at the end? You should just say yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 100%. The eggs themselves are more delicate, tender. The taste, still very rich. A little bit more similar to a salmon roe. Almost, isn't it? It has more of the fish flavor in it than the imperial. But we treat it exactly the same way when we make it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Is that it's a pleasure. Was that your caviar hand? No, that was my caviar Okay, good. I don't want to <laughs> shake the caviar hand. Black sturgeon caviar is the one true caviar. And soon, we'll see it brought to its highest potential. But first, I want to check out one more informal variety. Some call it red caviar, and it's made Sir. in Japan. Do a bow. <laughs> Meet Shozo, co-founder of Fume, a Japanese fusion restaurant offering top quality ingredients. Their loaded clay pot is a signature, and it comes piled high with one special wow. ingredient. That's a nice looking salmon. Did you catch that? <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> Did it come on a boat or an airplane? An airplane. I no. cannot go to Japan right now. Yeah, this COVID-19 crap is getting pretty bad. What I'm jealous of a dead salmon. Well, let's cut its guts open. I open the stomach. Sure. Yep. What is the season for getting salmon uh, roast? September to November, just three months only. Oh. Wow. Can you eat that yet? I must do kill for the bacteria. Oh. Didn't we eat raw blood like seven times now? <laughs> From birds? I think we're immune to everything. Wow. Oh, that's so much. Wow. The salmon roe are cleaned with salt and some sake to remove any fishy smell. They're rinsed lightly with hot water, then soaked in ice to prevent the eggs from shrinking. Thank you. Do I just take a whole shot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Kind of like a wrinkly old sack. Usually it's very plump. Here it's kind of like it melts into your tongue. Uh. It's like taking fish oil pills. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Next, they're soaked in a mixture of soy sauce, mirin sake, and seaweed broth for three hours, going from this to this. Mmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's popping. You know, it was so rich before, but now that soy sauce kind of cuts through that heaviness. Oh, what a big difference. Mm. You want to finish that? <laughs> These eggs can pair well with just about anything. Mm. Oh, it's so good with some rice. But they can also play a lead role, like in this. Here, he's combined salmon tartare, an egg yolk, fresh salmon roe, sea urchin, edible flowers, and gold flakes. Smell it directly. Hold yeah, on, on. wait, 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 wait. Yeah. No! Beautiful. Just try to get a bite with everything. Yeah, I think I got everything here. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Whoa, yeah. so much going on. It tastes like opulence. What does that mean? Like luxury. Mmm. I think the sea urchin can be a bit much for me sometimes when it's alone. But here, with the egg, it's some salmon tartare. It's really freaking delicious. And it's so rich, like. 
<laughs> Look at you. You got that Marvin face. <laughs> Our final course, his loaded signature clay pot. Hey, Mr. Big Shot, tell me what you want from me. It starts with cooked rice and five kinds of mushrooms. Add charcoal grilled A5 wagyu, herbs, salmon roe, sea urchin, Japanese black beef stew, edible flowers, and sesame seeds. In this oversized clay pot, wow. no joke, that's a lot of food. So all that's getting mixed up like some kind of bibimbap <laughs> that's worth $100 or more. More. <laughs> this is just a beautiful blend of super expensive ingredients. It's like the best of what Japan has to offer. It's only missing what, like Hokkaido scallops or something like that. <laughs> I say we go for it. Yes, let's go. Mmm. That's me. I've never had a sensation like this, where it's like this really fatty, savory, rich, delicious beef mixed with this kind of seafood essence. All of it is incredibly decadent, like over the top rich. The most expensive rice bowl that I ever had. Oh yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm not paying for it. I'm not sure who's paying for it. Let's dine and dash. You're gonna run. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is a super creative way to use the salmon roe. It's an ingredient, it's a star, it's like everything in one. But it blends together to make the dish better. Very luxury for me. So from here, we're gonna finally go to one last restaurant where they're preparing a bunch of high-end dishes using the caviar. Yes, let's go. Put her there, Julian, executive chef. That's right, of Green Saigon and Bangkok. When's the last time you were in Bangkok? Uh... Take me with you. After their Bangkok location was listed on Thailand's Michelin Guide, they opened their doors here in Saigon, offering modern European cuisine. When it comes to fine dining, one ingredient people always associate with fine dining or high-end is... Caviar. Cav yeah, okay, you got it. We've already been to the caviar harvesting facility. Is that what you'd call it? I guess I understand why it's expensive, but why do people like it so much? This, I don't know. <laughs> why do you like it? It's got different arrays of flavor, so you will find some caviar which are really briny and seawater. Some was uh, like roasted fish, so that's what it's interesting. While we're in the kitchen, Julian is cooking up two different caviar dishes. First, the puffs. A non-puff is filled with hollandaise cream. On the side, chitoro tuna is sauced, torched, and set atop along with Amur caviar found in the Amur River near the China-Russia border. Oh, juicy. Yeah, like a little pickle juice sensation, but very creamy as well, the texture of it. Oh, it's so satisfying. Mm. The second non-puff is filled with camembert custard and imperial caviar from the same farm we went to this morning. Cheers, let's try it out. Whoa. Mm. <laughs> It's like a jalapeno cream cheese. I apologize. I grew up in a trailer park. I only have white trash references. For me, this is like a nice spicy cheese. You go to the chip section. The Monterey. Yeah, cheese. Monterey. Uh, jalapeno, mm. which I love. It reminds me of a very nice version of that. There's one more we want to try in the kitchen. This one right here. Our second behind-the-counter taste features Carabineros shrimp, the most expensive shrimp in the world. The head is fried and the tail is left raw. He adds prawn oil extract from the shrimp itself, some lemon, chives, and finally, the caviar. Caviar brings some nice saltiness to it. Great fried little bits that get mixed with that raw section, and then the citrus kind of brings it all together. I like that. Still chewing? <laughs> yeah. That was a taste. Now we're heading into the main courses. Hey, we're doing it. Yay! It's actual dinner service right now in this restaurant, and uh, we brought lights. <laughs> First up, pickled beetroot cubes are placed inside a beetroot. Some spices, smoked creme fraiche, imperial caviar, and finally, dill. When you pay $2 for street food, do you get something that's literally smoking? Real fire, maybe? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's on fire. So this is really great, based on a Russian dish called borscht. Let's dig deep and try to get a little bit of everything. Mmm. Beets themselves are very underrated, but here, he's brought the beet to its highest potential. And really, the caviar and the cream together, and everything else is just splendid. And then you eat the bowl, I think? <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> Course two, finally putting the wood fire grill to work. Kaido scallops grilled and placed atop a seaweed bed. On the side, potato foam and asietra caviar coming from another prized sturgeon species. I'm gonna try a little bit of this potato foam with the caviar on top. 
Uh, that's from a potato. Oh, that's delicious. It's smoky, creamy, and the caviar is just soft and salty, but salty doesn't do it justice. It's not the same as just putting salt on there, like that oceany kind of saltiness. I was worried at first that I was the type of person who maybe I liked caviar because it made me feel fancy, but I think I legitimately like it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You're one of them, though. I'm one of them. Give it a little bit of a dip. Cheers. Cheers. Wow, it's so juicy. I don't know if I deserve this karma. I feel like something bad is going to happen to me after we leave. I'm excited about the next one. I don't know what he can do with caviar, I mean. A freaking bone. But this dish goes deeper. We want to see what's inside the bone. Have you ever had bone marrow before? Yeah, but not this big. Oh, from a goat? No. <laughs> oh, I've had bone marrow from a goat. I thought maybe you meant the same goat. W way smaller. Oh yeah, well, maybe it was a goat. <laughs> This thing gets grilled, roasted, and torched until the marrow inside breaks down, becoming irresistible. Then it's topped with an abundance of Ossietra caviar. Oh man, it's so heavy. This is so right? crazy. Oh my god. I don't know how much is too much. Okay. Cheers. Mm. Oh my god. This is so good, it makes me angry. Mm. Obviously fatty and rich as heck, but something happens when he puts the caviar on there. They complement each other. I'm getting sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> caviar, to be honest, I didn't get it. I've had it a couple times before. It just seemed like, okay, salty fish eggs. But now, after going through this whole process, I definitely have a deeper appreciation for why it's so valuable, but also why people like it so much. I do appreciate that the chef can be so flexible about using the same caviar. Like, I really don't know that it can be in so many different dishes in many forms. Much like life, caviar is meant to be savored. Yes, we should slow down for things like our kid's birthday, a first kiss, or a beautiful sunset. But that $20 dollop of eggs piled atop a ceramic spoon commands our attention, and it deserves our respect. It can make time stand still for one precious, salty moment. Today we're gonna see a premium buffet from a chef's perspective, learning how they satisfy demanding guests who are paying top dollar. We've got five main stations. Every station has signatures. We're getting one last taste of the highlight. It's amazing. I see a full tuna looking at me. And most importantly, have you had abalone? Never. Learning the right strategies to beat the buffet. There's so much food here. Yeah. We're not trying everything. Mm. I think we should get some snails. That's what you're gonna get at a buffet? Yeah, no. I don't know what to do. It all starts right here. We've come to JW Cafe, known for its sumptuous buffet-style offerings. You can see this battle in a man, a fight to the finish, we can war it to the end if you like, cause you and them see that time's not a thing here when you've been blessed and born to the life. See me, I got So right when you walk in, they have the dessert section. They've got fresh fruit, they've got little cakes and bars, they have a freaking chocolate God. fountain. Did you see that? Everything looks so beautiful that I cannot eat it. Well, everybody's about to tear it apart, so <laughs> we might as well be part of the destruction. This looks amazing. Wow. Look at that. Meet Chef Rene Ascom. Rene has a strong culinary foundation and 26 years experience in international hotel kitchens. Now, he's the executive chef managing all F&B offerings in this hotel's restaurant. Chef, put it there. How you doing? Welcome to Hanoi. Thank you very much. What kind of skills and experience do you need to properly run a buffet at this scale? Um, people, people skill, because we work with so many chefs, we have about 180 in the whole hotel. How can one person manage all that? I mean, what does your day look like? Quality check, I would say 20-30% of the time, and the rest of the time is planning and execution. Have you ever tried to go to a buffet that you didn't work for and say, I'm just going to do a quality check for you guys for free? <laughs> no. Okay, I was just thinking of a way to get a free meal. High-end experience comes with a price tag, unless you bring your own film crew. Here, you'll pay about $73. In the USA, it likely cost much, much more. How many different food items are available when you pay that $73? 400. 400. Wow. For that price, you're promised a theatrical gastronomic tour. How are you able to manage getting that much food prepared? Every section has a chef that's responsible for it. So basically, we work as a team together with all those chefs. We plan the menus together. 
Like a symphony that's been orchestrated a thousand times before, Chef Rene is the conductor, and every station works as a perfectly tuned instrument. What time do you need to begin preparation to have all these items ready in time? These items went on uh, this morning at 7.30. Food that needs time to be prepared starts first. Everything that's roasted or grilled is prepped and kept over fire, with portions sliced and peeled off during service. Lamb legs, bone-in ribeye steak, 26 pounds of meat, grilled to perfection. Next, suckling pig, roasted Chinese style. Duck, dried for two days. It gets seasoned and roasted, Beijing style. While the meat is being prepared, other stations are just getting started. Pasta, freshly made from flour, eggs, and salt. Kneaded, flattened, and cut into fettuccine strips. Dessert, crafting the perfect sweet blend of flavors, releasing one final gush of sugar-induced dopamine before you finally collapse from overfeeding. The seafood, coming just in time, loaded with a variety of sea creatures from around the globe. Shrimp, gooey duck, mantis shrimp, crab, Canadian lobster, and this 100-pound yellowfin tuna. I'm not sure what heaven's like, but if it can compare to this, I'd consider being good. It's all original. Enough staring at the food. It's Chef Rene is serving a taste fresh off the grill. Roasted lamb left. It's a beautiful pastured Australian lamb. Did it fly here? It's probably on the boat. Then I'm not jealous. Sorry, <laughs> these days with corona, I get jealous of food that can fly because I, I can't fly. I can we give this a try? Yes, dig in. Dig I'm gonna cut this a little bit. <laughs> Are you gonna no, I'm not, bite I'm off not. of that? Cheers. <laughs> Smoky and just super simple. You just bring it out the natural flavors. A little salt, a little pepper, and just a natural spice that the lamb has comes out beautifully. Usually lamb has such a like, strong taste, mm. but when you eat it, you, you don't taste it at all. Right, it can be gamey. Lamb, when it becomes over, the flavor becomes more strong, so you need to make sure that it's not too old. Wow, that's fantastic. Wow. What are the biggest challenges in running a buffet this large? The biggest challenge is to make sure that the people who come towards the end of service still have the same experience as if you just walk in at the beginning. Mm. I don't like food that sits in hot dishes. I mean, after 10, 15 minutes, all the vibrance is out of the food, the flavor is out of the food, and everything starts to taste the same. Here, they have a different strategy. Less waste, better flavors. All it requires is some thoughtful planning. I don't need recognition. About 10% of the dishes are cooked to welcome the soon arriving guests at 12 p.m. It's all about refreshing, batch cooking, making sure the food is not out too long. The desserts are artfully plated. I'm on a mission, yeah. Side dishes, salad, pizza, ready to go. Cold cuts and cheese, oh yeah, baby. Abalone congee, expensive, heartwarming. I know the future. Seafood, it's gonna be the item everyone is after. Seafood is king in Vietnam. People come basically because of our seafood selection. I don't need oysters, shucked, sashimi, sliced. Half the live seafood remains in the tank for guests who want to cook to order, and half is steamed, boiled, or grilled for a taste of instant satisfaction. Right now, preparation is underway for the brunch coming up at 12 o'clock right here, the seafood section. She's getting everything set up and put out. They have slipper lobster, spotted crabs, they have baby lobsters, everything. Just right here, you could get full of this super unique, very expensive seafood. Before we get started, I have to ask the chef, what is the right way to kind of cheat the buffet and really get your money's worth here? That's what I'm looking at. We're spending $73. How do I eat maybe $200 worth of food? Can it be done? Chef, it is 20 minutes until meal service begins. Is everything ready? I'm very happy with it. With the tuna here, are you gonna cut this up live in front of people and yes. make sashimi from this? Yes, absolutely. Let's do that right now. Absolutely. And cut to voiceover. And then we will appear back and we have oh, this. Oh, look at this. Wow. <laughs> the art of filmmaking. 
Here we have some sashimi tuna. Yeah. Do you know what part this is from? This is the back. The back is a little less fat. Okay, right on. I'm gonna just grab a little piece. You got it. Oh, here you have chopsticks. I'm gonna give it a little dip. There we go. Cheers. Oh, it's so yummy. It's a local tuna from the Nachang area. I love that it's local. I never would have guessed that it's from Nachang. The texture is so different from the tuna I have. In, the, in a good <laughs> way, like, usually it's far apart, you know? Yeah, super fresh, super yummy. This is where it gets really important. Okay. And this is where um, we should talk quiet because there's some corporate people around us. The buffet costs $73. Yeah. What is a good buffet strategy? Because I know I shouldn't go eat some fried rice and bread and call it a day. For me, I, I don't go to a restaurant for value eating. I go for experience. Okay. Are you satisfied? Well, let's get back to the question. <laughs> okay. You want to answer. <laughs> How about what are the most expensive <laughs> items expensive that you serve items. here? Okay. Because you have foie gras. It's a foie gras unlimited. Yes. I can eat as much as well, as much could, as you want. Who could eat more than one? Much? Well, you'd be surprised. We've had guests at a table of six, ate about 150 slices. What? Yes. Uh, really? Without blinking. And you didn't have to call the police? or uh, <laughs> Sorry, you didn't have to call an ambulance. No, no, no. no. <laughs> they walked out like nothing happened. Uh, some people love it. That's one way to get your money's yeah. worth. Foie gras, lobster, truffles, all the meats, the seafood. In the Chinese selection, there's an item with an abalone conch and some other high value items. So indirectly, you've given me the answer. Yes. If you want to beat the buffet, mm. you just got to eat a bunch of meat and then get gout. Yeah. <laughs> can you make it right when you always online? How can you make it right when you be talking all the time? You always talk right here is our first stop. This is the Chinese area. Oh, nice. Tons of food, but this caught my eye. Abalone. Super expensive. Have you had abalone? No. Really? Yes, so this is exciting. And it looks kind of funny. <laughs> it's... It, what's it look like? <laughs> There's so much food here. Yeah. We're not trying everything. It's important to first eat with your eyes. It's like yeah. foreplay. I'm looking at you. You look great. <laughs> I'm not going to eat you. We got to move on. Oh, really? Yeah, we're not doing it. Next section. Here, this looks pretty familiar. Almost like Vietnamese street food. What you'd find at an out or like shellfish restaurant. Okay, what do you think? Oh, lobster. Lobster. Right. Hello. Okay, let's get lobster. Yay. And some snails. So they also have Canadian lobster back here in a tank. I think we can just order one and split it. Okay. Also, I think they have something here I'm guessing you haven't tried. It's called a gooey duck. I think I've heard about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe like on National Geographic? Snail, grilled, gooey duck, grilled then topped with scallion oil and ground peanut. Spiny lobster, topped with bechamel sauce and mozzarella, then melted in the oven. Ah! Then the Canadian lobster, simply steamed. This is quite a fancy seafood feast here. What I like about it is we've taken a lot of things you wouldn't normally get to try, especially all together. I think we should start here. This is a spiny lobster. Yeah. How many of these lobsters could you eat? Like 20? 10? Two. Oh, you are the worst person to bring to a buffet. I know, I There's was no about to There's no reason to bring you to a buffet. All right, cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm. It's cheesy, it's chewy, it's satisfying. Mm. I think it tastes very fresh. It tastes sweet too. Here, Canadian lobster. Look like you when you go in the sun. Yeah, that's right. Oh, this whole day is worth it. I've been working so hard, walking around, staring at food all day. The only thing that makes me a little sad is in the US, I would have just a big bowl of melted butter to put this into. Here, um, fish sauce. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, <laughs> salt, pepper, lime. Cheers. Yeah. like a boss. <laughs> so good. This is so much better. It's yeah. better than the other one, right? Yes. The meat's real nice. It's still got like some chew to it, but not like so stringy and overall very satisfying. Mm. I always wonder like when you're like Oprah rich, is this like a snack? You eat 10 lobsters? No sh Yeah. We got some big, beautiful snails here. I like it. Doesn't really have a strong taste. Very chewy texture. Here, I'm excited for you to try this. Me too. This is a gooey duck. My first time having gooey duck. Okay. I've never had one this tiny before. Oh, it's bigger. No, they get literally this long. Yeah. You ready for another round? <laughs> mm. 
Chef, we're back for more. Excellent. I was thinking, usually when I go to a buffet, I might mix and match and kind of make my own recipe. You have pasta. Yes. You have foie gras. Yes. You have truffle. Exactly. Can we mix all those? We, I can mix anything you like. He's allowing me to ruin the name of French cuisine. Chef Rene pan sears the foie gras. He blanches the pasta and combines it with a green mushroom sauce. Plate, pile it high with slices of burgundy truffle and eat. This is a Frankenstein creation. This is crazy. It's not a dish and no one would ever do this except for me and it came from my brain. I think we should just cut the foie gras in half at first. Ready? Okay, cheers. cheers. Oh my God. It's like I'm eating like a piece of butter. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say like a piece of art. No. But yeah, like butter. <laughs> Very rich, buttery, creamy. It just gently cascades down your throat like a fat kid going down a water slide. Here, I'm gonna mix some pasta with some truffle with foie gras. Cheers. Mm. I kind of like it. Somehow it worked. Thank you. Well, I'm a bit of a chef myself. I mean, I didn't cook it, but. I gotta say, the noodles do a good job of cutting some of the heaviness of that foie gras, but it is still plenty heavy, but I still like it. I can tell. I think we should get dessert. Oh, still? Mm, yeah. Let's do it. Here they make a dessert in front of you. They make a teppanyaki ice cream rolls. You know teppanyaki? <laughs> so the base is vanilla. Over here, they have 16 topping options. You pick two, I'll pick two, and we'll put all of it in there. We want blueberry, roasted almonds, meringue, and gummy bears. Most of the happiness I've felt in life has come by way of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Food just makes me feel good. Moya. Yeah. <laughs> That's delicious. This buffet, I could come here every weekend for a year and still find new flavor combinations that set off my taste buds and make me smile. Like achieving nirvana, but with none of the discipline. It's not cheap, but my God, is it worth it. I guess I loved you once. From researching and shooting to editing and mastering, our 10-person Best Ever Food Review Show team works hard to roll out the highest quality travel food entertainment twice a week. If you like what we do here, please consider supporting our Patreon. Patreon allows fans of the show to contribute a monthly sum and receive a load of extras, like early video releases, private Q&As, and beyond. To learn more about our Patreon, check out the link in the description box down below. And if you can't give or don't even feel like it, that's okay too. <laughs> We're just happy you're here. Boom! Guys, that concludes our fine dining series. A huge thank you to Twin. Did I say it right? Yes! Twin is on the Instagram.com. Follow her there. Gentlemen, only uh, polite DM messages. <laughs> you know, I gotta tell you guys. <laughs> the men are animals. That is it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. A uh, peace. Yay! All right, let's uh, leave. And maybe they won't notice we didn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. so hard, but to tell you the truth In a woman your age, it just ain't cute When every night I end up picking you above the floor